Hi everyone and welcome to the 100th episode of Grass Chosa. Before I get on to tonight's guest, which was such a great interview to celebrate my 100th show, uh, you know, as a lot of people know, I raced my first race, uh, my first round of this year over the weekend in the V for 2023. Wasn't the weekend that I was hoping for uh, where I had suspension issues and steering issues, you know, and, you know, not being able to compete in the last race. It was too risky. Uh, the parts we needed were not available at the track to fix the car. So it was great to be back in the car, but disappointing that, you know, we couldn't compete uh, a bit further forward or really have a good shot at uh, getting to the 10. But on to tonight's guest. Uh, you know, I've actually grown up listening to him for a long time. I've admired his great work in commentary and on podcasts. Uh, the podcast would be Rusty's Garage, and uh, I spent, you know, so many trips to the track listening to it. Um, I'm going to be honest, I go to bed and I put on a podcast, um, and I do sometimes put on Rusty's Garage. So, you know, most of you know him as Rusty, um, but, you know, he's also done a little bit of grassroots racing along the way, which I'm surprised we didn't talk about too much, but not many people might not know. Some people might not know him, but it is a big welcome to Greg Rust. So, Thank you so much, Greg, for joining me tonight. Uh, usually you're the one asking the questions tonight, Rusty. So tonight will be a little bit different, but can you share your love of motorsport and where it all started when you were younger? And thank you very much for having me on, mate. Um, first of all, you are absolutely right. It is very rare that I'm in uh, the hot seat having the questions asked. I mean, if I'm honest, mate, it's weird because um, it doesn't. it's not something I often do. Um, it all started for me when I was about, uh, you're a bit older than what I was. I was um, maybe 18 months old with my parents. They were um, and still are very keen, uh, my dad in particular, very keen on Speedway. So they would take me in Sydney to places like the Sydney Showground Speedway, which is now gone, um, along with Liverpool and Parramatta Raceway, which are no longer either, very sadly. And um, I just loved it, mate. I loved the sound, the smell. Um, the atmosphere with the audience and and so on. And I was kind of hooked. And so I, I you know, as I grew up, I, uh, I wasn't all that far from um, a circuit, a permanent circuit called um, Amaru Park, which was a really cool little, little track in Northwest Sydney. So I, I saw touring car meetings and things like that there. Um, and the, the racing was at a very, it's kind of fitting that I'm on the grassroots racer chat here with you because um, I, when I was in late high school, I went uh, thirds in a a club car with some mates. It was a, a late 70s Mitsubishi Galant with a roll cage and race seats and harnesses and uh, a bit of work done to the motor and sports exhaust and so on. And we used it for all kinds of things, from rally sprints to um, hill climbs and and a bit of sort of lap dashes and so on. And I did a little bit of karting as well, mate, but I was very average at it. Um, but I, I enjoyed the experience and that little bit of time um, behind the wheel um, only inspired me to be a part of the game, but maybe in a in a different way because I just knew I wasn't ever going to be anything special as a, as a driver. Yeah, obviously um, it's very hard to make a name for yourself in racing if you start at um, too late of an age. I think the youngest or like the oldest Australian, I think, was Mark Webber to make it in Formula One. You know, 11 years old is pretty late in your career, I guess, to start racing. Um, so for you to start, I think you said eight, 18 or just as soon as you left high school, um, to race in a Mitsubishi Glad that you used for, you know, club racing and stuff. Were you very successful at it? And, you know, you did say you were very amateur, but did you ever win any events? I have a couple of trophies, mate, but but nothing to gloat about or to get excited about. Um, uh, what really happened, it, it, when I left um, high school, I went off and started working in banking and finance. And um, if you ask me now, uh, knowing the kind of creative stuff that I work on, you know, would I ever go back to working with numbers and stuff? I just, I think that would drive me mad. Um, but I did the banking and finance as a day job and um, the cart club that I was with at the time uh, went along to a major race meeting at, at at Sydney Motorsport Park or Eastern Creek as we often called it back then and um, 
they were a support act and they said to me, look, we know you're not racing. Uh, they only had the premier categories that were there. I was only in the um, in an ADCC supercar, which was a lot of fun. That's another yeah. story. But anyway, um, they said, will you go along and talk to the commentators? And I said, I don't want to do that. And they said, no, 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 you'll be fine at it. You'll be, you know, you, you love talking and blah, blah, blah. And so it was just for the big screens and the PA. So I went along and did it. I worked with the late Greg McShane, who worked on Speed Week for many, many years, and Andy Raymond, whose father you will know, Mike Raymond, who's now sadly left us. Mm. Uh, so I worked with those two guys who I thought were tremendous. They were very good to me. That is our sort of simple questions that I had to answer. And at the end of it, the producer came to me and said, have you done this before? I said, no. He said, do you want to do it again? I said, yes. And uh, I started working on, of all things, truck racing, over the PA as a pit reporter, which I still, I mean, I still love pit reporting to this day. And away it went, mate. And it was just kind of moonlighting on weekends. Uh, I had a very understanding boss at the time who liked motorcycle racing and had seen or heard me at Phillip Island and places like that. And he said, hey, you should pursue that. And he gave me a great set of circumstances where I could work maybe three days a week with him in finance and earn enough money to keep me going, but then go away on weekends and and um, chase the dream. And I figured out pretty quickly that that's what I wanted to do. I went off and studied in it and, um, and yeah, got some jobs in radio and things and, and away it went, Ed, and yeah. Mm. Yeah, I definitely know. Um, I, I believe that I might be able to do something with my racing, but just in case I can't, um, I'm obviously trying to set up a media, but I guess sort of I'm trying to give myself a head start. Um, so I'm That's doing good. a podcast. I go to radio once a week because um, the radio sh motorsports show has me on there. So I am trying to put my foot in the door um, in case racing doesn't you know, work out. So, but you know what, mate? E even if even if it doesn't, the the media stuff that you're doing. Let's say you don't go down the media path and you pursue the racing full on. What you're learning on the media side will help you immensely, mate, as you as you go. See, there's no losses there. That's a great thing that you're doing. Yeah. Oh well, one hundred percent. When people, uh, it's like people involved in media or radio, it's like, can we have a quick chat? I'll jump in straight away and I'll do it because I'm trying to uh, put myself out there and expose myself to the media because I know these days, especially if you want to put yourself out there, it's uh, talking to anyone you can who's got a microphone. It's good for you. It's it's a great skill, mate. You know, I, I spend a little bit of time media training now as a as a part of the the different things I do. I've worked with um, uh, athletes beyond motor racing and some some very well known um, racers as well. And uh, you know, I, I when they're younger and they're still doing you know high school or karting or whatever, I tell them you you any stuff that you can do around a public speaking at school. Um, they're, they're great things that will help you. So when you walk into a a boardroom and you're trying to talk to them about sponsorship for your Formula V or if you're being interviewed for the live stream or the broadcast or if you're at an awards night for something and you've got to get up and make a speech at the end of it, um, it's a great skill, mate. Most people you'll probably know, but um, public speaking of that kind and doing the stuff that we're doing now with the media, I mean, it, it rates as... Uh, one of the top five greatest fears for people. And people would almost prefer to jump in a pool with crocodiles rather than than do public speaking, you know. So, um, but, but with what you're doing on, on either side, Ed, and whether it's uh, racing or um, the, the media stuff, it's a it's a great skill and, and you're to be congratulated for doing it. I really do appreciate that, especially coming from uh, yourself. You know, you said your racing was very grassroots, but you really trained yourself in media to be able to go out. Uh, like you were even on, um, you were with TCR last year, you know, doing a bit of pit reporting. You've done bits and pieces here in supercars and that. So, you know, to talk to someone like you who's had that experience in pit lane and even in the commentary box sometimes, um, which, you know, it can be, it can be a pretty cool experience, you know, sitting up top of the track and getting to watch some, motor car racing while I get to talk about it as well. I have a very simple philosophy and that is um, I am a storyteller and my job is to be a, a connection, a conduit to people like you who are actually racing and to help tell your story. So if, um, because I particularly love interviewing and, uh, you know, whether that's the, the podcasts or being in pit lane, 
if I can find out an answer to a question that I think the audience is thinking about at home because of what's unfolded in the contest, in the race, mm-hmm. that's my that's my job, mate. And and with the commentary, you depending on the role you have in within the, the commentary box, I mean, you um, a lot of what I do is very um, traditional, what they call play by play, where you're describing what's what's going on. But commentary has evolved a lot too, mate. It um, you know people like the great Daryl Eastlake and and Mike Raymond and what have you, you can't uh, you can't copy them. You, you that, that what they did was enormously special and it should be held in in that regard forever. You have to be yourself, mate. It has to come from your heart at the end of the day. Um, and so long as I can do that with a bit of with a bit of polish around the edges in what I say or how I say it, mm. um, that's that's box ticked for me. But the most important thing is that I think I'm a storyteller, mate. I'm I'm not a star. My mother tells me uh, every couple of days, keep your feet on the ground. It, for me, it's about um, uh, b- being that cord that reaches with the microphone to get to the the rider or driver or engineer or whoever it might be, and and getting from them the information that I think people watching or listening would want to know. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a very hard task, like especially for me going around trying to grab people for interviews on my show. It can be very hard sometimes. So I do understand where you're coming from to a certain level, just probably not as professional. But how would you go as like, you know, say you're at Sandown with Stan Sports, what who would you go to? Would you go to someone who's relevant to the media at the minute, or would you go to someone who's not really mentioned at all? Like what? Yeah. You, you try. You try and find out stories. So as you're going, um, let's say as the race is unfolding, um, Michael Caruso is is leading, and Tony Delberto is closing on him. Um, you know, the things you endeavour to find out are, uh, you know, has Tony got a got a problem, or can he fend off? Um, uh, Michael, etc., and uh, you, you, you garner that information, and then you use it to add to what is happening: the pictures, the commentary, uh, whatever it might be. So, um, in the heat of the contest, that's what we want to know. So, you, you got to follow the contest and what's going on. But sometimes the pictures will be on Ayrton, who's leading the race, yeah. but. There's a story unfolding with Greg, who's four or five cars back, who's got a problem. So you you want to go and find that out and and mm. um, add that to the to the mix. And it's not good that that poor person's got a problem, but you need to answer that question: What's going wrong with them? Why are they dropping down the timing order, or why are they going slower, and so on? So th- that's my job, mate, is to be eyes and ears and and on the look for things like that. I work with some very very good people. It's not just me. Um, what you don't see is a team of people behind the scenes. I mean, at Bathurst in the in the supercars era, and I've done done that twice now with those guys, and they're still very, very good friends. At a Bathurst, you might have 280 staff working on that event to make that come to life and to to be beamed to your your screens. So you play a very important part in the front line of that. You've got a very big responsibility to to do a good job for those people who work long hours to bring that broadcast together. Um, but they help you in that process too, mm-hmm. mate. They, they often I'll have, I'll have earpieces in and you'll have a director in your ear or a producer talking to you and you're trying to spit out the words at the same time and tell the story is very difficult. But um, uh, like any good team, you have a race team, you have people and friends and family that help you with your car it's the same the, the the same struggles and strains that you go through when you, you run a race team, you also go through in television and and but you also equally, when you do a very good broadcast, uh, you feel that same sense of success, mate. But it's it's the sum of many parts. Um, sometimes it doesn't always work out. Sometimes there might be a technical issue or something that goes wrong. You don't always have your best days, but it's about. Um, once it's gone to air, it and it's gone to air. You can't change it. You got to, you got to, you, you know, pick up and keep going. Yeah, sometimes you just got to keep rolling with it. But back to where you were talking about, um, you know, the story that's happening as you're racing. Say, you know, as the example, Greg has an issue. Would you have someone who's a part of that media team who would be already at the garage asking questions so they can feed the information back to you so you'd know? No, no, but but you may. 
be tipped off by them. So you have many resources at your fingertips. My producer might talk to me in my ear and say, hey, um, we can hear the radio for whoever it might be. They've got a problem. Go and find out more about that. So I would go to the garage. Sometimes my cameraman that I work with, I mean, they're very experienced, mate. Some of them have been around motor racing for 30 years. So they know the people, they know the players, and they can sense when something is not right. So sometimes my cameraman will spot something that I mightn't have and they'll go, hey, that, that's a bit odd. We should look into that, you know? Mm. So again, it's about working with your team. So uh, there is a pit, pit producer. Uh, sometimes they work with you on the ground, um, garnering stories in between the racing mm. or, before, or before the broadcast. But during the race, they are typically in the outside broadcast truck with communication to me they can radio me and and tell me about something and we can workshop ideas together we can go what do you think about this or is this a good story right now or do we leave it for later or and you you're always thinking about ways you can complement what is going going to air and i'm a huge believer Ayrton, in balance so let's say i interviewed you now about a controversial moment that you had with greg rust on track and yeah. you gave me your version of events i would absolutely make it um, either either my job or, or or a recommendation to a to a colleague who might be in pit lane that we go and get the other side of the of the discussion the argument we always try and present a balanced viewpoint for for people like uh, you know a Neil Crompton or a Mark Scaife who are who who have been and are very good racers uh, Mark Larkham the same when it, it, it's those guys and their opinion that matters because they've been in that seat they know what goes on as a as a driver so they can impart a different opinion it's not up to me to do that i might share an observation that i've made but i yeah. try and find out the answer to it from the races that are involved yeah 100 percent. so even if you're at um Gansville when anton de pasquale made that move on shane van gisbergen which resulted in him spinning and then anton slid down and Shane didn't let go back past. You would definitely try and get both sides of that story because M most definitely, most definitely, and you you try and do that respectfully. So when they get out of the car, you know they might be a bit hot under the collar. Um, they might want to talk to you straight away, and they'll make eye contact with you, or a team member will be there, and you'll you'll react with the team member. The team team member might say, "Hey, just give us a moment here," or or no, no, you're free to talk to him. Off you go. Um. So you just, you read that situation. But yes, I would always try and get both sides of the equation. And I would hope, mate, that that after, you know, 20 plus years of doing it, that they would trust me to ask uh, a, a fair uh, but respectful question. They're, they're not going to, in that moment, just expect me to um, be soft, but, but I'm not going to be a you know captain controversy either I, I will ask the question with a a sense of what i call empathy or or, or yeah. um you know un, try, try and understand and get from and let them describe what they are feeling or their viewpoint it's not up to me to impart that it's up to me to try and help them come forth with that uh, to a level that they are comfortable with sharing if that makes sense yeah so you don't want to try and force an, an answer out of them but you would like I want it to be like natural. I want it to be them. I want it. I want it their their real view, their real viewpoint that they are comfortable with sharing. Yeah. yeah. And and sometimes like um there was the you know the incident with Scott McLaughlin where he'd won at Adelaide, I believe it was. And he got out of the car and he just let his emotions out and he, you know, he slipped up by saying a swear word on TV, which is a no no. Do you gotta when you go to approach a driver, do you sometimes have to go, is it not worth it right now because they're caught up? It, it, you'll read the situation after many years you'll you'll understand it the one thing about scott in that moment it was beautiful and it was real and it was him yeah. and he apologized for the, the swearing there was no um uh you know people might argue well we don't want young kids hearing that language and there's a there's there's truth to that right but what i admired in scott in that moment was that it was his real emotion, Ed, and how he really fit, fit, how joyous that battle was and how he handled it. And he just described it. And and as a result of that, he earned a huge amount 
of fans. Now, that doesn't mean you immediately go out and try and swear every time you're doing an interview. That's not what you do, right? He used a Kiwi term, jandal, like a thong, right? Give it some jandal. And he he bled a swear word in there and apologized for it when he did it. But it was this, just this, this uh, special moment of emotion that captured it beautifully. And people got that. People watching at home will forgive you if you make a mistake. They know that it's not easy and not everyone can broadcast. It's not an easy thing to do. Um, but what they did is that they were like, wow, he is one of us. And 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 that's why um, he is still and and getting even you know more popular uh, with each outing in IndyCar. That, that's why he's loved, mate. I mean, he's a great racer, obviously, a very competitive human being. Um, but... That personality. That's the thing, Ed, in, in in media training, I try and talk to young racers about you have to get the result right. You have to get the the win or the podium or the pole position. That's a given. So you channel all this energy into trying to do that. But ironically, if you looked at it like an 80-20 rule, in fact, it's it's the 80% of the time outside of the car where you're with sponsors and working um, to be on time and presentable in a broadcast or an interview or whatever, that will help you get um, noticed and sponsorship and and so it will roll. Yes, in the 20% of the time that you're in the car, you have to kind of give that 80 to 100% commitment. No doubt about that. That's the results that matter. But out of the car, how you present yourself, what you do, um, how natural and real you are with a little bit of polish around the edges. That's what people want to see. They want to see the real you, uh, not some um, uh, wannabe character. It's got to be the real you. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I want to try and say this in a way that's kind of the nicest way possible, but would you sometimes avoid certain races who don't really give well-responding answers? Like they'll say, yeah or nah. You know, they'll just give you one-word answers. It, it, it is a tricky one because you go into it knowing you could be confronted with that. It is also my job to help them feel comfortable and to try and uh, use different techniques to get them to open up. And if it didn't go so well, uh, once the cameras uh, are finished with the interview and it's no longer going to air, you might have a, a conversation off camera where you talk about how you can do it better next time. You know, you want to help them... Um, at heart, mate, I love this sport. Um, I I want um, everybody to enjoy their livelihood around it. I play just a small cog in the in the wheel of that. And if I can, in that moment, just just a little bit of guidance or coaching to sort of say, hey, look, ne look, next time let's aim for this or let's talk about that. And that's not me being condescending or or, um, or anything like that. It's just me wanting the best for that person. It's tricky, mate, because if it is a controversial set of circumstances and that person is hot under the collar, they may not want to say or do something that brings the sport into disrepute. And I get that too. So actually them not offering up a lot in their answers, um, you know, that, that's not great television sometimes, but it also does give you a, a window into the tension or just, just how stressed out they are at the time. And that's actually not a bad thing either. You know, you just, just got to read the situation. Yeah. Oh, okay. So I can definitely see where you're coming from now that you've uh, explained it a bit better to me. Like say you're at an amateur event, do you really try and interview heaps of people to try and, you know, it's like, say you see someone like me, uh, a younger kid who's in a category who's a bit too young to be there. Would you try and go up to them maybe and try and talk to them just to see, if you can help them in a way by giving them a shot? It depends on what I'm there to do. Um, yeah. I'm, a, I'm a huge believer in the the onus is more or less on on you. That's not in a um, in a nasty way. I don't mean it like that. What, what I'm meaning is like anything in life, if you want to succeed, you need to um, – show that hunger, show that determination. So what I would be kind of looking for is for you to come up to me and say g'day. And and um, uh, of course I would go and happily talk to you in the pit lane or the paddock. I, I do that as a part of my, as a part of my job, but I think by you taking the initiative like that, that's a great first step, mate. You know, it's, it's, um, 
it's equally up to me to go and talk to lots of different people when I get there. But I think if you um, if you make that effort, it, it says a lot to the broadcasters. And this is another thing that I, I say to young racers is that, you know, try and get to know the commentators, try and get to know the journalists and give give them some information in relation to what you're doing. You know, it can be as simple as a post-race um, email that you, you might have a database of people that are sponsors, journalists, uh, commentators, whatever, and, and you know, you you blind copy all of them on the email and you give them a little a little one page summary of how your weekend at Sandown went. And that's a great thing because it helps the sponsors. It helps you hopefully develop a relationship with the commentators. And it gives, in my world, a bit of information that is useful for the broadcast. And then because you're trying to set yourself apart from other races, people recognize that. They recognize that you're trying. Um they can't favor you over somebody yeah. else, but they but they recognize that you're trying and and you are then on their radar, if you like, mate. It makes them go, Oh, okay, he could be good to talk to because he's he's you know furnishing us with information. He speaks well, um, he's um he's available uh, when we need him to do different things and and they they remember that stuff. That's probably what I what I would say. When I when I go to some of those grassroots things, like I, I had a meeting when I was in New Zealand recently with the the CEO of Kart Sport New Zealand, and we talked about a couple of young racers that are going overseas that have a karting background and they're just starting in in circuit racing with some great opportunities. And we talked about how we could um you know, have a bit of media training discussion with them that might help them on that path. And it could be as simple as what you and I are doing now, a Zoom-based chat where I walk through some some things that might help them. Or it could be that I'm actually there at the track with them and we sit down for half an hour and just, just you know, talk about a few basics. Or a, a full training session where I've got a, a camera and microphones and, and other things to simulate stuff. So, but I, to, I mean, this is a long way around of answering your question. Um, I'm a huge believer in giving back. I've been very fortunate to have a career around something that I grew up loving that is, you know, when you, when you talk to people, I'm very lucky to call that my job, Ayrton, very fortunate. So I, I, can, I, I try where I can to give a little bit back because I think that's important and it's important for the next wave of broadcasters, racers, whatever it is, to hopefully be as much in love with it as as I am still to this day. Yeah, 100%. I have to agree with you. Like, I, I love to give back as well. Um, and that's why I believe most of my partners um, stay on board with me because, as you can see, I've got quite a few. That's good. Um, that's good. You're doing well, mate. Yeah, I think they like to stay with me because I try and give back as much as possible with room on the car. Um, doing the podcast is also another reason. Um I try and give back to them by doing the podcast. I try and put their name over the screen well a little done. bit more. So, yeah, well I definitely agree with you um, with the giving back stuff. But what do you think your longest lasting relationship is with a driver? You know, like who you met when yeah, they were That's public? hard. Yeah. I mean, I've I got lots of different stories I could I could tell you. Um, uh I, I'm a huge believer, as I said before, in not playing favourites because you just, you just can't. There, there are going to be moments where you – I try and get on with with all of them as as best I can. Um, sometimes there are moments where that gets tested, but I would I would hope that after all this time, if it did get tested, that people will go, well, that's just his job. He's doing his job, and and at the same time, I respect that it's the the racer's job. Um, mate, I was there when a young Greg Murphy arrived in Australia with a flat top haircut and drove a Formula Holden, and and um, you know he was a fresh face on the Australian scene before he'd even won any of his four Bathists. Um, and I, I still uh, regularly deal with him to this day. So he, he's a, uh, a friend and colleague. We've done some great broadcasting together. Um, and then, you know, similarly, I've, I've had um, in the more modern era, um, I, I get on super well with um, Shane Van Gisbergen, um, all of the broadcasters. Um, who else is another example? Uh, there's, there's, Ed, and there's lots of them. I, I would... Hope, mate. I I try uh, every way that I can not to have an enemy. That's just just how I am programmed in life, not necessarily in what I do in the media. 
Um, but there's been some long, long-term things there. I mean, it's crazy for me to think back now. I get on super well with Stephen Richards, for example. And, you know, to now think that, um, you know, his own son, so Jim Richards' grandson, Clay, is oh, yeah. racing and doing some great things. And, you know, you would have seen him around the Victorian scene and so on. I just think that's amazing, mate, because I can remember. There you go. There you go. So I can remember clay as a real little tacker when i i um caught up with with steve and Ange at a barbecue and things like that around their racing and um you know the early days when you know he won his first bathurst and so on and um so yeah mate, you know, to think now that he's a he's a dad of a um a good young fellow who's chasing his own racing dream is amazing that that those years it and have gone very very fast yeah i honestly do wish the best for clay though because he's um He's really progressed. He's stepped up from Formula Four now. I'm not sure if he's still doing it at all, but he's um yeah, he's progressing up. I hope he has a great year in the eighty sixes. You know, sometimes those cars are a bit unique and it takes a little while to get your head around them. But but typical of his dad and his grandfather, the, the car's super well presented. He really applies himself, which I like. Um, and he applies himself out of the race car as well. So um I hope he has a fantastic year, mate. Yes. Mm. Yeah, he's uh he's definitely not just the name. He definitely puts himself out there and he really gives it a crack, you know. He does. He does. And um, you know, for say, you know, you've been friends of Stephen Richards for a long time now. Do you were you there when he won Bathurst in two thousand eighteen? I I um have been fortunate, mate, to be at uh, just about, if memory serves, um, every Bathurst that he's won in some sort of capacity. And if I wasn't with TV, I might have been with radio or doing something along those lines. So, um, you know, when you see him and the elation when he wins races and things like that and how much it, it means to him and, um, you know, he might have had a famous father, but Stephen had to very, you know, very much work for it. He, he um, didn't just open every door for him, but yes, the name is synonymous with racing, but he worked um, super hard for it. And he's a very grounded guy, mate, a, a, a genuine um, person who properly, properly loves cars. And, and um, yeah, to, to see him succeed like that and win all those Bathursts, you know, not unlike his dad, I reckon's awesome. Mm, yeah, definitely. And, uh, you know, if you could go back and talk to your 16-year-old self, what advice would you give <laughs> That's a great question. Um, great question. Well done. So when when I uh, I talked to you at the very beginning of this about, you know, working in banking and finance and then having the chance to go off and do some broadcasting and so on. And um, at the time, both my, my dad ran a hydraulic company. He was general manager of a hydraulic company with about 60 staff. Oh. And my, grand, my grandfather was in... Um, uh, the the rag trade or clothing clothing trade. He used to used to go around the world um, acquiring cloth for a, a clothing company. So we we would always love the tales that he would have when he would come back from overseas, having been somewhere. So they were both in business, right? And I thought there would be big pressure of sorts on me to do something um, similar. So when I said that I wanted to get out of banking and finance and go and have a crack at this media thing, which I had never really expressed an interest in in high school, I thought they would hit the roof mm -hmm. and they couldn't have been more supportive, right? So I can I can vividly remember my father telling me, um, you know, there might be hard yards in this where you, you're trying to scrape together money and, and what have you and going from job to job and said, but you have to give this a real honest, hard working shot, you know, at least two years, see if you can make a crack at, at, out of it for, for two years. And at the time, mate, Lee Diffie and I were, and we, we talk Diff, as you know, commentates IndyCar and has done some amazing things in America. We're great mates and still are to this day. And we were both climbing that ladder together and doing the hard yards. He was a school teacher before he became a, um, a commentator and the, 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 the most important thing for both of us, mate, was having a go, backing yourself, um, giving it a real proper shot. And um, yeah, I'm a huge believer in that. So that that would be the thing I would I would tell myself not to be afraid, 
to get out there and have a go. My own kids now, I have teenage kids and I, I it probably sounds a bit cliched, but I talk to them about chasing their dream too, mate. I think it's super important and doing something that, that your heart is in. You, you've got to be properly in it and passionate about it. And um, yeah, I, w- I would probably tell my 16 year old self to um, not be, not be afraid to roll the dice and have a go and chase, chase what you love and chase it with all your might. Yeah. Well, thanks so much, Rusty. I know you're a very busy person and uh, it really does mean a lot to me um, that, you know, you've found some spare time to come talk to me tonight. Uh, you know, thanks so much for some of the stories that you've shared about your motorsport journey. I feel very privileged to um, have such a respected person in the motorsport industry on my show. Um, but Pleasure, mate. Yeah, I, I really do wish you all the best for this year ahead and I uh, look forward to see what you get up to and uh, I hope one day you'll interview me when I get a bit more experience. Um, and, yeah, I think, you know, you know, you've know, you made it if Rusty's interviewing you. So thanks so much, mate. Well, you, you turned the tables on me, mate. So it was you interviewing me. I love the fact that you're doing um, some racing. I, I That feeling, that sense of joy you get, it and from being behind the wheel, there is very little in life that will ever um, surpass that. Over time, my work has afforded me the chance to drive a few cool cars. I don't drive them like the pros do, but it gave me a sense of what their world is like, and that is a hugely special feeling, mate. So enjoy that, chase that, get after that. And what you're doing here with the podcast has all sorts of benefits for um, your partners and for your growth as a um, you know, as a sports person or a broadcaster, whatever you choose to do. So um, go get them. Thank you very much for having me on. Um, stay in touch, and uh, and I hope you have a fantastic year in twenty twenty three. Thank you so much, and uh, remember everyone to drive fast and take chances. Safely, of course.